Mike Pence announced that he is dropping out of the 2024 Republican primary over the weekend. Usually that surprise announcement, I mean, he sort of sprung it on people, would have been huge news. There just has not been that much national interest in that primary contest, and that's because Donald Trump currently holds an enormous dramatic lead in the polls. He is the big red line at the top. His second closest opponent, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, green line, finds his lead getting smaller and smaller. And this failure to gain any momentum has caused some problems for the candidate that some in the past have called short Trump. That attention is where all the attention on Ron DeSantis has been lately, not on his positions, but on the interesting boots he's been awkwardly strutting around in. The internet has become obsessed with these mystery boots and the theory they might contain lifts in the heel to make Ron look taller. Shoe experts have weighed in on the weirdly long sideshow Bob style toe box situation that maybe is because there aren't any toes in there. Maybe because the foot is back up on a stilt in the back, like stiletto high heels inside his manly man cowboy boots. It's all speculation, of course, not the type of thing anyone is seriously focused on. What they're trying to say with this is that in your boots, you have heels. No, no, no. Yeah, no those, those are just standard off the rack um, Lucchese. Um, uh, how, how, tall are you? how tall are you, Governor? How tall 5'11". Are you? 5'11". Okay. Why don't you wear tennis shoes and dress shoes? Uh, I do wear tennis shoes when I work out. Yeah, 100%. you do. Yep. Okay, I got a gift for you. I'd love for you to wear. Okay, I shop at Ferragamo. Okay, and I, got, I don't accept gifts. I can't accept I, it. I totally get. I'm it, sorry. Do you think Ron DeSantis thought that was going to be his fate when he got into this race, when he was the the world beater, when he had just romped? to re-election when he was the guy who was going to take on Trump. You think that's where he thought he ended up in that guy's podcast, getting Ferragamos? To add injury to insult, a new poll from NBC News and the Dwayne Register shows DeSantis now tied with a rising Nikki Haley. Jamel Bowie is an opinion columnist for The New York Times. Tim Miller was communications director for the Jeb Bush 2016 campaign. Now a writer at large for The Bulwark. Both join me now. I, Tim, um, as, as, a, as a veteran of a, a one of these primaries, I saw, I saw like, I think, I, mean, I think I'm not projecting, but like a, a flicker of like deep existential dread and despair flashing through Ron DeSantis's eyes as he finds himself on some dude's podcast talking about his shoes, like, at, like, like on the sort of like freak show fringes of a race that he was supposed to be at the center of. Yeah, it kind of always looks like he's about to snap, uh, to be honest. It's kind of his face, uh, which has been one of his problems in the primary. But I, I also noticed some dread. I do have to say, I, I don't have a ton of sympathy. I really don't have any sympathy for somebody that signed up to be Ron DeSantis' communication director, my old job. But I, I do have just a little bit of, like, professional uh, empathy for, for the idea that had I put my candidate onto a podcast that was totally meaningless and then on the podcast they got lectured about how they're supposedly wearing high heel shoes, <laughs> I, 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 I wouldn't have wanted to be in the car with the candidate after. I was just, I would be taking an Uber home. So uh, that's pretty embarrassing. And uh, I, I mean, I, I think this mostly just speaks to how relevant the campaign is and obviously there are more serious issues on the fact that he's out there saying that 11th graders can't talk about their gay family members, but he can wear high heels. Uh, there seems to be some inconsistencies there. I do think the former is probably more important. Yeah, I, I think w what is striking to me, I, I have the feeling now about this primary, which, again, I guess I tried to keep myself with an open mind as we went into this, Jamel. Like, I don't know. The future's unwritten. I, I keep telling myself all the time, like, I keep reminding myself of what I thought was going to be my year in February of 2020, which constantly keeps me honest about how much I can extrapolate the future from the past. But what is your understanding of why we have ended up here in which a possibly competitive primary has been this, what you're seeing? You know, I, I think it's it was not quite inevitable, but close to inevitable as soon as the Republican Party collectively decided in February of 2021 that Trump could just skate past January yeah. 6th, no problem. Yeah. That no one was really going to try to contest that. That as soon as that decision was made, first, Trump's narrative of the election cements in stone, I did not lose. It was illegitimate. I actually am the victor. 
every other Republican has to defer to that narrative. You'll remember last year when Ron DeSantis seemed like he was riding high, he wouldn't even really challenge that at all, right? No one would really challenge that narrative whatsoever. You have this unchallengeable narrative about how Trump actually won the election, and Trump is running again. So it's like, well, of course he's going to be ahead, because he's still the uncontested leader of the Republican Party. Uh, there's no one willing to say, you know, in the in the presidential field, that no, this guy actually lost. This guy's a huge loser. We're not gonna, we're right. not gonna go with him. Um, and then all the other candidates, rather than trying to distinguish themselves in any meaningful way from Trump, are all pitching themselves for the most part. There's just variations on the theme. I'm like Trump, but I'm like more competent. I'm like Trump, but I'm like you know. A, 37 year old Mati Wen kid, like, you know, just various variations on who Donald Trump is. And so, <laughs> take it together. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you. Take it together. The ex my expectation really has been, of course, Trump is going to be the nominee. Like, there's no, there's no way in which it, it's, it's shaping out that it would be anything else. Yeah, and I think that the, you know the, 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 that point about that that was a decisive moment, Tim. That the sort of that narrative about the loss, right? For a bunch of different reasons, in terms of the political expediency of like you're a loser who lost. Like generally, parties don't like take the guy that just lost the election and then be like, yes, you're our path to victory. So there's that. There's also just the the sort of moral consequences of that as well. But I think you see that in the Mike Pence. You know, you know, if, if the idea was. Trumpism without January 6th, right? Like, there's a plausible case for Mike Pence, who is, like, there as a loyal soldier every step of the way but for the coup. And the fact that he can't even make it into Iowa says something about how doomed that is. Yeah. For sure. I, I almost entirely agree with Jamel with maybe one slight uh, exception, but uh, that was the moment in February. I, not only politically, but the narrative that he set in, but also practically. Uh, you know, there are senators in this race, right, that could have voted to yeah. convict him and would have, and that would have eliminated their top competitor. Genuinely speaking, if you're a guy like Tim Scott, who, if you're running a serious race and you're at the bottom and you have a chance to cast a vote that could eliminate your top competitor, that would have seemed like a good idea morally and strategically, but they all didn't do that. So that was part of it. Um, and, and I do think that there was maybe a second window after the midterms when DeSantis could have made this case yeah. really strongly, right? And I do, and you saw it in the polls, yep. the numbers were there. This guy's a loser. We saw yep. it again. We tried again. I, I do think there was one more window after in, in, in November of 22. Uh, as for Pence, just really quick, I, him and Mike Johnson is the best example of this. And these are the two things. They're literally the same guys. They have the same positions. They're both religious conservatives. They're both named yep. Mike. One of them becomes a speaker. The other drops out. The only difference between them is January 6th. And that shows you how January 6th is so central to the Republican psyche. Yeah. In the end, I think also, I mean, that, that there is going to have to be, Jamel, I think the, the, the other thing driving this is that people think that Trump is a possible contender to be president and the polling backs him up. I do think everyone has forgotten a little bit of what a trial, national trial is going to mean the politics of. And I, I, I continue to think that's underpriced. What do you think? I think that's probably right. Like a, a, a unprecedented trial of a president during, a former president, sorry, during an election year, seems like the kind of thing that's going to be consequential, especially since what we know about Trump is that it's whenever he is really in the public eye, whenever yes. he's actually loud and present, that people don't want anything to do with him. Notably, right now, he's sort of faded to the background. Right. And when he fades to the background, and you see him, you see this in his polling during his presidency, when he fades to the background, people become a little more tolerant of him. So we'll have to see how, it, how things <laughs> yes. look when he's back, back in the foreground. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Jamel Bowie, Jamel Bowie and Tim Miller, great to have you both. Thank you.